We all like to think we have good taste in games, along with a base knowledge of what makes certain games great and others not so. I mean, I went to uni for it for like four years and I dropped out, but <laughs> you know. But I definitely know there's always more to learn. And sometimes I think about the games that help me both understand the types of experiences I respond to, but expanded my view of what they can achieve or how we got to where we are as players today. And on top of that, what are the games I know I need to play to expand that knowledge? For such a young medium still, it seems like we have an infinite number of titles that have shaped the minds of players and designers on what makes a game work. And honestly, at times it can be hard to keep track of the ones that leave the biggest impact, the ones that will be remembered in decades to come as the Citizen Kane of gaming. Because something that would be a death sentence in one genre could be an unforgettable experience in another. With all this in mind, I've tried my best to curate a list of games that I believe are essential to understanding this wonderful medium to its fullest, both the peaks and the dips, from the games that nearly killed the industry to the ones that saved it, this is the start of the essential games list. And before I go any further, I want to preface this whole video with a few disclaimers of sorts. First of all, and now's the only time I'll say this because it should be assumed in every other video I make, but I'm not trying to position myself as the final voice on this topic. In fact, I'd really like this video to be seen as more of an invitation to an open discussion rather than a concrete opinion piece like some of my other content. Even while recording this, I'm excited to read the comments on what you think should be added to or removed from this this list and why, because it will be updated with your suggestions and opinions. I want this to be a group effort, not just my own, oh look how epic my taste in games is jack off session. That's what the rest of my channel's for. Second of all, I have not played all of these games, which might make you think my opinion on why they should be there is invalid. And to be honest, you could be perfectly right, but if I haven't tried a game on this list out, you best damn well know I plan on doing so. And I'm aware enough of the cultural impact of said games to know that they're important. I've had this list in my mind for ages now, but only in the last couple of years did I tick Final Fantasy 7 and Resident Evil 4 off the need to play section of it. And my final disclaimer, I am not perfect. There are plenty of genres I'm not well acquainted enough with to know what is considered the best or most important, and that's where I need your help as well. Like, is Burnout 3 THE racing game of all time? I don't know, but I'm almost certain there's someone watching this video who has an encyclopedic knowledge on the racing genre and its history that could tell me. I've tried my best, but again, open conversation. Also, if you think this list is absolute trash, I'd genuinely love to see yours. I'm not being facetious here either. I just love this concept and I want to hear as many opinions on it as possible. Now that's out the way, I'd like to talk through my thought process while making this list. There's a link in the description if you'd like to look it over while the video is playing or check it out after it's finished. So what does make a game essential? For me, it had to fit into one or more of these three criteria to be included. Either being a landmark title in the industry, a game that defined a genre for a period of time, or one with major historical significance. What does any of this mean? Well, a landmark title, the way I'm describing it, is something that was either a big technical or artistic breakthrough, or was just a game that was seen as one. I don't think anyone is going to argue that Metal Gear Solid 1 wasn't a huge achievement in games at the time, just for pulling off a cinematic blockbuster story with characters that have less polygons than Venom Snake's right ass cheek. Likewise with Doom, and while Wolfenstein 3D was first, Doom polished it to become the household name it's known as now. Which brings me on to the genre definers. These are the games that come to mind when you think puzzle game or platformer. It was hard for me to choose what games to put based on this criteria here, since a lot of this can be purely personal preference. You might have grown up with Bioshock, but most of what makes that game great is borrowed from conventions that Half-Life 1 and 2 set out for single player shooters at the time. That was until Call of Duty reinvented the FPS again. In fact, I've included a lot more shooters than other genres in this list, just due to the transformations the standard has gone through over the years. It was also a challenge to decide what games go on here, because like, do I put what's commonly regarded as the best and most popular of its genre, or do I put the inventor of the genre itself? I'm still torn on this approach, and it's something else I'd love to hear your opinion on in the comments. Since the creator of a genre could also be considered historically important, a lot of the time, context is equally as important as the content itself. A game like the original Sonic the Hedgehog could easily be seen as just an average 16-bit platformer if you were unaware of its place in gaming history. Sometimes extra reading is required to understand why I'd put Duke Nukem Forever on the list, but I do feel it's necessary to experience the bad games that are sometimes equally as important as the good ones, especially for games like E.T. for the Atari, which caused the whole industry to crash for a good few years in the West. Games like that I think shouldn't just be read about, but played. If anything, just to get a snapshot of what caused such an uproar. 
Mortal Kombat being another brilliant example of this, being responsible for the ESRB's creation and also being the poster child for the violence in video games moral panic of the 90s and early 2000s. Something I really struggled with was not just putting games I think are great on here. As much as I want to put any of my top 5 of all time on this list, I can't honestly say they're necessary to understanding the medium. I was gritting my teeth putting Persona 5 on this list instead of Persona 4 or Shin Megami Tensei 4, which I do think have much stronger themes and story, or in the case of SMT4, the best turn-based combat ever made, but I just know that 5 has been the closest a JRPG has gotten to replacing Final Fantasy as THE game to define that genre. And depending on when you were born, it might have succeeded in doing so, which is a scary thought to me. <laughs> I'm getting old. I also know that as far as mechanics and game feel in general go, it might be considered the peak in terms of mass playability and appeal. All of these thoughts might be me just taking this list way too seriously, but I've always made an effort to distinguish the difference between what my personal favourites are and what I think is just good. For example, Persona 3 has a lot of personal significance for me that I'll certainly go into one day, but I'm fully aware it has a crap load of issues that just make it a worse game to play compared to 4 or 5. And Another thing I struggled with was thinking of newer games to include in this list. After the PS2, it became a lot harder to remember games that were genre-defining or left as big of an impact on the industry as titles like Resident Evil 4 or Symphony of the Night, and I feel this is just because of how quickly the games industry has progressed, or stagnated depending on your mindset. It's a lot harder to be genre or convention-defining when they've already been solidified. Of course you can be so prolific you create your own genre, but it's still less common nowadays just because of how time works. Citizen Kane released after film had been somewhat mainstream for a good few decades. But what is gaming's Citizen Kane moment? This phrase was memed a lot after being a box review quote from Empire Magazine, the well-renowned gaming expert, for The Last of Us. I've put that game on here, but mainly because it's known as the best and most well-made modern third-person action story game along with being incredibly well-renowned in general. But I still think the question of what is gaming's Citizen Kane moment is still an interesting one to discuss. And I know what my answer Answer is. To say video games had a rough transition into the third dimension is like saying Kanye West's mental state is just a bit wacky, and to call Super Mario 64 just a 3D platformer is like calling The Life of Pablo just an album. I've been listening to a lot of Kanye lately, okay? <laughs> just What I'm saying is that Mario 64 laid down so much of the groundwork and conventions for gaming going into that new dimension. If you're playing a 3D game, it's almost certainly been influenced by Mario in one way or another. Now I'd like to cover some picks from this list that might be seen as controversial inclusions, or non-inclusions, and explain my reasoning for them, starting with the one that will probably get the most people riled up, Gone Home. This is not only the definitive walking simulator, but it also played quite a big cultural part of that year and just time in general for games in not only the public eye, but also deep in the hardcore base as well. I'll admit, I was one of those dumb reactionaries to it when it released. Keep in mind I was like, what, 14 or something? My opinion on it now is that it tells a pretty good story in a very interesting way, but I think it deserves to be on this list due to its genre-defining status and as a touchstone on a part of gaming history, even if it's one that people don't often want to look back on. Games don't exist in a vacuum. There is a culture around them, and it does affect how they're made. A couple of titles that feel like they should be there but aren't are Metal Gear Solid 3 and Undertale, two games that are absolutely fantastic, just really really good, up there with the best of them, and if I was to include one of these games, it would probably be Undertale. Due to the cultural impact it had on audiences. Metal Gear Solid 3 on the other hand is just really solid. It didn't break any boundaries, it didn't set any technical milestones that MGS2 didn't already achieve, it just took what made the previous two games so great and made the definitive Metal Gear experience. If people in the comments roast me hard enough, I'll probably include them, because even while writing this I feel like an art host so up themselves it's creating an infinite void. Am I taking this too seriously? Absolutely. But one of the main goals from this list is to be there to help newcomers and veteran gamers find what they like, to help create tastes while also teaching some gaming history in the process, not to force my own tastes onto the people reading it. But saying that, fucking die Katana? Really? <laughs>
Listen, right? It tells an important tale of how badly one guy's ego can fuck up the entire development of a game, and how quickly that man can fall from grace because of it. Again, it's something that needs to be played to understand how absolutely awful it is. Just like Duke Nukem Forever, which is a piece of gaming history whether you like it or not. If I could include the pre-patched version of Cyberpunk on here, I would. So yeah, I've taught you through my thought process while making this list, and I hope you enjoy it. But before I leave you today, I'd like to share a story with you about my experience playing one of the games off of this list, because I think it highlights both why I think these sort of discussions are important, and also I think it's an experience I hope viewers like you might have as well if you decide to try and tackle the list like I am. The game I'm talking about is Final Fantasy VII, something that's been on here since the first time I had this concept, and I've been putting off playing it even before that, until May of this year. While I was off sick from work for a week, I needed a long game with an epic story to distract me from my body ripping itself apart. I also felt like tackling one of the many entries in this list that I hadn't tried out myself, and it just felt like the perfect opportunity to give it a shot. Now, playing what is known as THE JRPG, knowing various plot points and bits about the game, you go in with some preconceived notion of what's gonna happen, and I really wasn't expecting to like it. I'm not the biggest fan of many anime tropes, and the story from what I'd seen looked tropey as all hell. The graphics look like, well, you can see what the graphics look like. And the combat? It's 90s JRPG combat, how good can it really be? There's no way this game can hold up to modern day standards. And you know what? For the first five or so hours, I felt I'd been validated in all of these ideas. I remember laughing my ass off at the janky translations of awkward flashback dialogue, not getting the combat mechanics because the game didn't give me enough tools to fully explore it early on, and in general my opinion of it was that it was really quite crappy, but in a very charming way. <laughs> then, as I was leaving Midgar, and saw that iconic shot of the party looking over the horizon, I felt something change. I felt myself warming up to this game in a way I didn't think I would, and over the course of a week I found out that yes, it really does still hold up. Despite the graphics, despite the janky translation, I ended up falling in love with this game. The pacing of it is still a marvel to behold. Every few hours it's got something new to show you, whether it's a weird snowboarding minigame or a truly inspired location to explore. And as I did all these things, I started to care deeply about the characters, the story, along with the world they inhabit, and by the end, my heart had truly been captured. Sure, it's got a lot of cliches, but it surprised me with how well they're pulled off, and the added knowledge that for a lot of people, these were their first introductions to them, made it feel like the classic I'd always heard it being. After its slow introduction, the Materia system has now become one of my favourite RPG mechanics of all time. I thought playing through Final Fantasy VII would be the video game equivalent of reading a history book, and it totally does show its age in some ways, but I was blown away by how much I ended up loving this game, and it feels weird to get why Persona 5 has been the only JRPG to even come close to overtaking its status in being the genre of finding experience that FF7 still holds the title of. Sometimes when going through this list, you'll play a game that created an entire genre, but over time has been outdone by its successors. Sometimes you'll play something that status overshadows the actual experience itself. And sometimes, you'll play a game like Final Fantasy VII, which still contains the magic it had nearly 25 years ago. A game that once you finish it, makes you go, yeah, I get it now, and I personally can't wait to take the next title off of this list that makes me feel that way again. Thank you for watching this video, it's been really fun to talk about, and I hope you had fun watching it too. <laughs> I've had a few people ask me about it, so I've made a Patreon, it's there if you want to support the channel, but just watching me is more than enough, seriously. Uh, I'm also streaming on Twitch now, uh, I'm gonna try and do it semi-regularly, like hopefully at least once a week, uh, follow me on Twitter to find out when I'm streaming, or just follow me on Twitch. Um, I've already got my next video planned out and I think it's gonna be something special, I think. So look forward to that whenever it comes out. That's all I've got to say, uh, Tifa's best girl.